Hey everyone, this is Patrick. Welcome to the first lecture of the wet lab module, where we'll be talking about molecular cloning and we'll do a bit of a focus on DNA. I just wanna say right at the beginning of this lecture that it takes a while to, to record these lectures. So I might be changing throughout the lecture um, or the lighting might be different over time. And that's just because I'm recording throughout the entire day. So just be aware of that. So without further ado, let's dive into it. First, we're going to talk about the learning outline and the learning outcomes. So this lecture has four parts to it. In the first part, we define what a gene is and we define what a part is. And so it turns out that these parts you can predict using online tools. So I'll introduce those to you folks. And you can put these parts together into composite parts, devices, and systems, or in other words, interacting gene networks. In the second section, we talk about how to play with the DNA. And specifically, we're going to talk about how to copy and paste these parts using PCR and different assembly methods. And then once you have assembled your DNA, in the third section, we'll talk about self-free expression systems. And lastly, for section four, we'll talk about commercial services to, you can use to support your endeavors in the lab. So those are the learning objectives. The learning outcomes are a little bit different. It's what I want you to get out of this lecture. And what I want you to get out of it is some understanding of what the jargon is in, in the field, um, develop an intuition for how to work with the DNA, uh, an intuition for how base pairs match together, for example, and how they kind of click is the term I like to use. Um, know what to do with the DNA after you've, you've finished putting it together so you can transform it into cells or maybe you want to use cell-free expression systems. And then have an awareness for what exists in, in the commercial space to help you with some of the cloning uh, problems. So it includes sequencing and it includes synthesis of your DNA. So in the first section, we're going to be talking about genes and parts, which are really analogous to electrical circuits that you find in general electrical engineering. And uh, if, if you've ever played with electrical devices, it's very akin in the terminology that we use. And so I want you in this section to focus on the terminology that I'm using to pick up that jargon for yourself and to get a conceptual understanding for how these different genes and parts can be talked about and how they fit together in one big cohesive story. Let's begin by talking about the architecture of genes. So genes are comprised of parts, that's their relationship with each other. And these parts are typically transcriptional and translational elements that allow for your protein of interest to be produced, that allow for gene expression to occur. And so the, the classic configuration of these genes the prototypical architecture looks like this, what we have here in this picture. And so the parts in this gene that are related to, to, to the transcription are the promoter at the front where mRNA will begin to be produced afterwards. And as well, the terminator at the end that indicates where the mRNA should stop being produced. We also have the translational elements parts, where we have the open reading frame, or called the ORF is what we normally say, or just ORF. Uh, and this will encode for a piece of RNA. So if it's destined to be a protein, it's an mRNA. And if it's destined to be some functional RNA, it's just simply going to be the RNA. It's also at the beginning of it is the RBS, or the ribosome binding site, which is where initiation of this translation begins. And so in particular, the ORF is designated by where the start codon begins and where the stop codon begins. And so these positions are very important because they will determine the, the position of your ORF relative to the RBS, which may have effects on the efficacy of producing that particular RNA or protein. And so what's happened is that over time, there have been, they've been differences in way, the way people use the term gene. And so sometimes people use the term gene to refer to the ORF, whereas what we're going to do in this entire SIMB0 lecture series is try our best to just use the term ORF if we're referring to the part that will encode the protein itself, and gene if we're talking about this entire, uh, this entire what we call, uh, I guess, composite uh, amalgamation of parts into one functional unit. What synthetic biologists like to use are what we call genetic circuit diagram symbols. Uh, and that's because sometimes when we draw these genetic circuits out on paper, 
we want to use symbols to represent what we're talking about. Uh, the same way that in, in drawing electrical diagrams, you have different symbols for resistors, for the for where the voltage sources are, etc. And so there's a bunch of different uh, symbols that are used, and this comes from the ESPL uh, synthetic biology language. Um, but don't worry about that. Just worry about the actual symbols because that's what people use. And the top five symbols that people use are these five right here that we're going to be using and seeing in our in our lectures. So this right angle arrow is the promoter. This is the coding sequence. The ribosome entry site is also called the RBS, the ribosome binding site. Sometimes you see it shaded in as well, uh, but it's generally a semicircle. The terminator is drawn by the T, and sometimes you see two Ts to indicate that there are two terminators, and that's often put in place to really make sure that the polymerase stops its, uh, its production of the RNA at that point. There's also the operator, which is what is used in conjunction with the, the promoter to regulate the expression of that gene. And so let's kind of see, oh, and by the way, there's also two other important uh, symbols that, that isn't in this, this table. So when you're trying to indicate interactions between different uh, genes, you use a, an arrow to indicate some form of activation, some positive interaction in general, and you use the stop arrow to indicate some form of negative interaction, so inhibition or repression. So yes, let's, let's see what this looks like in an actual diagram. And so this is what we call the Collins toggle switch. Uh, and let's talk about it from an experimental point of view. Braden in the dry lab module will talk about this a bit more mathematically. Um, and we'll focus on kind of the interactions between these, these different moving parts. So to orient you in this diagram, let's first look at top right where we have PLAC, this is the promoter. So this terminology PLAC, P indicates that it's a uh, promoter and LAC indicates the gene origin. So this is originally from the LAC operon in E. coli. But we've taken it out and we're using this promoter now to express two ORFs, ORFs. So it's going to encode for a TET-R. This is a repressor protein and it's going to encode for GFP, which is a fluorescent protein that glows green. So it produces the RNA for this, which will then end up being two separate proteins. Now, the GFP is what we call a reporter molecule, or, a, just, or more simply, just a reporter. And all it's going to tell you is that if there is a green signal coming off of your E. coli or, your, or any microbe, uh, it's telling you that this particular gene is active at that point in time. And so that, that's why it's called the reporter molecule. It's reporting the status of the cell for you. Now, at the same time, it's producing the TET-R repressor. This is a protein that's going to inhibit or repress this particular promoter called PTET. And they correspond to each other, and that's why they have this TET in both of them. So this is going to repress PTET, which means that this open reading frame set is not going to be expressed. You will not get expression of the LAC-I repressor or the RFP red reporter the for, for, for red. Uh, so you get none of this is actually off due to the expression of TET-R. And so that's kind of the first state of the toggle switch, and that's kind of the terminology being used. So I'm going to stop there. Um, we'll, we'll talk about this particular toggle switch more in the future, but that's me just trying to show you how these different symbolisms can be used in the diagram. Now, this particular diagram is actually a simplified version of what I've drawn here. So you see some of the, the obvious ones that have already been drawn. Uh, there's the operator, there's the promoter, and these are the ORFs. What's typically not drawn are the RBSs, unless they're really important and pertinent to the actual topic. So the RBSs are actually located here and here. And sometimes you might see the RBS being overlapped into the actual ORF itself. And that's just the nature of how operons work. Um, and you see the double T here indicating that there's probably going to be two transcriptional terminators at the end of the gene to stop the, the transcription. So that's the Collins toggle switch. And that's how we kind of use the symbolism to describe to our, our genetic circuits. Now the Collins toggle switch is clearly illustrating 
a bunch of parts being put together to form some kind of useful uh, system in that case. So there's some categorization for how you can describe how these parts are put together. And so there are three categories. In the first category, we have what we call composite parts. And so these are, are I'm reading from the slide, non-functional combination of parts where there's no gene expression. And that's where, what I want to emphasize is that there's no gene expression. So if you look down here for what I've drawn, in this first case, there's the RBS and the ORF. There's no promoter where you're not going to actually get gene expression. And same thing for this case, uh, there's just a promoter and ribosome binding site where you don't get any ORF, or if there's an operator as well, you don't get any expression of the ORF. And so these are non-functional because they can't actually encode for anything just yet. But typically people will like to put these together. For example, a promoter and RBS might be put together because that is what's always needed to be paired with your ORF to get some kind of actual expression. And so people like to separate that because you might want to design sets of promoters and RBS together for some level of transcription or translation. The second category are, are devices. And so devices are, are what we canonically know as, as the genes. And so they do have gene expression. And so before, when you saw in the Collins toggle switch, this is an actual full-on device. And so the simplest devices are, de are, are genes where there's just one open reading frame. And this particular device, there's two open reading frames, but the simplest device that actually most iGen teams, for example, will work with only encode for one uh, protein or RNA from one ORF. So that's the device. And so devices can kind of be designed to work with each other. So the Collins toggle switch is an example of a system where two different devices are repressing each other uh, depending on some chemical inducer. Now, there's other ways to put these different devices together. And what I've drawn here, for example, is what we call a logic gate. And so through some, some presence of IPTG or ATC, uh, depending on what's present, in this logic gate, it'll output a certain reporter molecule, such as GFP. And so you can see how this can be useful where you're trying to sense things in the environment, where if you only want to sense two signals, and only if two signals for, are present, for example, you would use a AND gate to, to produce GFP to tell you, the person who can't see what's in the water, for example, that there's the presence of copper and some toxic environmental pollutant. And so you would use an AND gate in a system of devices to generate that GFP to tell you, okay, look, in the water, you got some form of contamination. And so these logic gates can be put together in much more complex uh, uh, computational uh, devices, sorry, uh, systems to really report on, in this particular case, multiple uh, inputs and through some computation give you some output. That could just be GFP. Now, logic gates is one clear example of how synthetic biology borrows terminology from computer sciences and mathematics. So Boolean logic and truth tables, this is kind of the, the, the basis behind a lot of these different logic gates and genetic circuits. So the two basic logic gates that I want to introduce are the AND gate and the OR gate to, depicted by these particular symbols. So what we have on the bottom and what every single uh, logic gate has with it is something called a truth table. So in this truth table, it's you can read it by first looking at the top. A and B indicate the two inputs that the AND gate can take. And then based on what inputs are present, there's some sort of output, some computation. So an AND gate is relatively straightforward in the sense that you need both signals to have an output. So you can see that with the, if in the absence of A and B signals, no output. If either one of them is present by itself, there's no output. And only when they're both present is there an output of, of one rather than zero. The OR gate is in a situation where you're looking for either one of the signals by themselves or both together. And that's why uh, you see that for the bottom part here, uh, and if, if there's ever a signal from A or B, or if they're both there, you get an output of one. Whereas if there's no signal, then it's zero. So let's put all these uh, uh, AND gates together and see what happens uh, using genetic circuits. So we begin with this particular uh, device where we have expression, gene expression of ARSC, which is a repressor protein.
And so this repressive protein will bind to the promoter called PBAD. Uh, and so this particular setup is quite often used in, in genetic circuits. And so arabinose will prevent ARSC from binding to PBAD. And so as a result, you get some expression of something downstream. And so if you have two of these devices, so in this particular device, it's working in the same way, but just for IPTG, what happens is that if you have activation of both PTAC and PBAD in the presence of arabinose and IPTG, you get production of these two proteins, IPGC and MXIE, which then can then come together to form this particular uh, oligomer that can then activate expression of PIP-AH, which will produce something else down, down the line. And so this is an example of an AND gate being used where you have two devices working together that can sense these two signals. So if you have two AND gates coming together, so in this case, for example, we have um, this particular AHL uh, compound uh, activating PLUX and we have ATC activating the PTET. It'll produce this particular system where you, let's first look at this, it's kind of complicated. It took me a while to actually do figure this one out. So E, X, S, D, and A are expressed here when ATC is present. So when they're expressed, typically E, X, S, A, this orange protein, will be able to activate this promoter. But the issue is that it's being expressed with the, with the uh, E, X, S, D, which is this yellow blob. And so because they're being expressed together, what happens is that it, it actually forms this particular dimer. And so it can't activate. And so only in the ex in presence of this particular compound will EXSC be produced, which is this purple molecule, that can bind to the yellow part more tightly and take it off of the orange part. And so the orange part, which is EXSA, can then now activate uh, C. So it produces this in VF. And earlier we said that PIPAH was produced when you had these two molecules present. And so now you get this particular setup where you form a dimer that can now activate the expression of RFP, which is the red fluorescent protein. And that's going to report to you that you have, in fact, the presence of these four different inputs, these four different molecules. And so this is called a four input AND gate because you need four inputs coming together to form one output that you can read. And so you can imagine how this can be useful in environmental sensing if you're trying to sense for the presence of four different compounds. So that's, that's an AND gate. The OR gate is a little bit simpler in genetic circuits. So here, for example, you have one particular um, um, composite part in this case. So what's happening is that you have promoter and ribosome binocyte to, to have some expression of a downstream open reading frame, but you also have two different operators uh, rather than just one. And that means that if, and if either of these operators are present, then you won't get expression of the things downstream. And so that's an example of an OR gate where you have, if you have one or the other, you have some kind of effect. And so this gray line over here is just depicting the fact that this is an OR gate. So as I said, biological logic gates allow you to respond to environmental signals and then compute some kind of, some kind of uh, message back to you through these devices working together in a big genetic circuit. Now, the, I wanna really emphasize that these logic gates and biological systems aren't just constrained to genes uh, working together to these devices. It's also, uh, you can also use logic gates for systems where you have, for example, an RNA that's able to fold in such a way where it can bind to a compound, and then that will lead to some kind of some kind of uh, output. So, for example, uh, I'll just briefly mention it. The toehold switch is an example where you have a expression unit, a transcriptional part that basically prevents downstream expression of your gene, and only in the presence of a piece of RNA that matches a hairpin in this part can you get expression. And so that, that's an example where you don't have to have uh, a, a particular gene like this to cause expression and to use a logic gate. You can also have 
other interacting biomolecules doing that too. As you saw, you can put these different parts together in very complex systems, but let's talk about how you can control these parts to behave differently in these systems. And so to do that, we're going to talk more specifically about, about some of these parts. So in, in, in particular, when we're trying to change the rate of transcription, we want to modify the promoters and the terminators. If we want to affect the rate of translation by changing it, uh, changing the protein expression levels, we want to modify the RBS. As well, modifying the RBS will change the rate of translation. And if you want to decrease the, the, the lifespan, basically, of your protein in the system, for whatever purpose, say it might be toxic for the cell, so you don't want there to be too much of it for too long, you have degradation tags that can also reduce uh, the effective rate of translation. So we first begin with uh, promoters. So promoters are used to initiate mRNA production. It takes the ORF that you want to produce and puts it into a form that ribosomes can then process to produce the protein. So in synthetic biology, we like to describe promoters based on their strength. And so strong promoters lead to more protein. That's the kind of terminology we use. And so I want to kind of highlight the, the molecular basis behind this. So if we look at this particular diagram here, we see that the promoter is comprised of the negative 10 region, typically called a TATA box, and the negative 35, sorry, the, the, the minus 35 region. Um, and so these particular regions are important from a molecular point of view because the RNA polymerase and the sigma factor, sigma over here, um, it actually looks a little bit like this. And so the, the minus 35 element you can see is binding to the protein in this particular domain, and the minus 10 region is binding to the other side of the protein. So there's a physical basis behind why the position of the TATA box in the minus 35 region can affect the ability for the polymerase, the RNA polymerase, to produce your mRNA. You can imagine that if you mutate the, the sequence of the minus 35 region or the TATA box, you might affect the binding strength onto the protein. And so to very clearly define what promoter strength means, strength is defined by the binding affinity between RNA's polymerase 2, typically, and your actual promoter sequence, your physical piece of DNA. So again, there's a physical basis behind promoter strength. It's not just some abstract concept. The stronger the binding affinity, based on how well these sequences match the amino acids in the, in the protein and form that interaction, that binding affinity is what determines promoter strength. And so if you look through different promoters, we generally see that the primna box, the tata box, or in other words, the minus 10 region, uh, there's a lot of similarity in it. And typically you have TATA. Um, and for the minus 35 region, again, you can see that it's the, the position of them relative to each other is kept the same. And that allows for the RNA polymerase to properly bind to the promoter and then begin that transcriptional process. And so, you can see that they're all slightly different, but they do have similarity. And so what we call is the set consensus sequence that tells us what the, the canonical sequence of these different regions are. And so if you deviate away from this consensus sequence, you're more likely to either increase or decrease space in these mutations and the RNA polymerase that you're working with. And so to kind of guide you on what, how to interpret this, if you look at the minus 35 region, for example, uh, at each uh, position in this minus 35 region, this box, there's probabilities for what nucleotide is most likely to exist. And so if you look at the minus 10 region, it's very likely that you have TATA at the beginning, uh, the TATA -TA here. Um, and that's kind of what we, we think of when we say virus and binding sites, this TATA sequence. And so you can engineer the promoter strength. You can very precisely modify uh, the strength of this binding event by specifically mutating the, the nucleotide sequence of these different regions. Now, promoters come in a couple of varieties, and there's kind of two categor categories for it. Uh, there are promoters that are not repressed, called constitutive promoters, and there are promoters that can be induced, meaning that they're normally not 
uh, they're not doing anything unless there's some kind of signal that you give it. So these are called inducible promoters, and they're kind of controlled by what we call operators. So I've mentioned these terms before, but let's look at that more, more closely. So here we have, for example, uh, these should be called ORFs for our case, but they're called genes, but that's okay. Um, you have a promoter here. Now, if this particular operator, this is represented by the O, wasn't here, then the promoter would freely be able to, to bind to the polymerase, the RNA polymerase, and then express the mRNA for these downstream ORFs. Now, in the presence of an operator, it's a physical piece of DNA uh, here, what happens is this pink protein called the repressor is able to sit on, literally sit onto this piece of DNA. And because it's sitting there and not moving, you sterically block, that's the term we use, we, you, block, you physically block the RNA polymerase from doing any form of, of downstream uh, transcription. So there's no transcription and therefore no mRNA made or just RNA. And so these repressors have, you know, they're, they're evolved through in, in nature. So they've been evolved to respond to different signals. And so, for example, the, the, the operator for the lac operon responds to lactose or allolactose more specifically. So, you, so there are different repressors based on different signals. There's, there's ones for copper, arabinose, as you mentioned before, different chemical compounds and metabolites. Now, the, the cool thing with inducible promoters is that in nature and also through, through human intervention and engineering, there have been inducible promoters that have been designed to have what we call ultra sensitivity, meaning that th there is a certain threshold, uh, the concentration of some compound that the repressor responds to, where once you hit that threshold, suddenly the repressor is able to pop off uh, very quickly. And so because it's able to do this in such a tiny time scale at that particular threshold, what happens is that you get something called digital behavior, where you know if you are below this concentration, this threshold, it is off. Where if you, off by off, I mean the, the gene expression. And if you're above this threshold, you're above this concentration, um, it turns on. And so this is, you know, this refers back to, to electrical engineering and electrical circuits where you have analog behavior and digital behavior. And so analog is kind of a, a more gradual response and digital is kind of a switch on and off. And so ultra sensitivity in terms of inducible promoters refers to that particular process of being in a state of zero or one or on and off. So some common promoters that are used in molecular biology and synthetic biology, uh, I want to describe some of them very quickly. So for protein workflows where you're trying to mass produce a protein to study it, uh, PTRC is a, is a derivative of the PLAC promoter that's much stronger. Uh, and so there's also the T7 promoter, which is from a phage that is arguably and perhaps one of the strongest promoters that we use uh, in protein expression. And so typically, these both will use IPTG as their inducer to activate gene expression, to activate protein production. And so we, use these, we like to use these ones because they have the strongest rates of transcription. It produces the most mRNA to generate uh, that protein. Now, in devices uh, and in circuits and systems, Promoters that I typically use, I've mentioned before, are PBI, which responds to Rabinos, PTAC, which responds to IPTG, PLUX responds to that one AHL compound, uh, and PTET responds to, 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 to anhydrotetracycline, or just ATC. Uh, and actually, there is a bunch of promoters that, have been, that are called the Anderson Promoter Series. And these Anderson promoters are basically uh, promoters that have a range of, of strength uh, from weak to high to allow you to express your proteins at different levels. And sometimes you want to pick a specific level because you want to control how much protein there is in the, in the situation, in, in, the, in the cell. And so uh, here we have different sequences of the Anderson promoter series, and not in the same order, but in, in an increasing order of strength, we have what we see here. 
And so with increasing promoter strength, you have increasing expression, and that's how you can see differences in RFP expression, for example, what you see here in this picture. The other part that is related to controlling transcription are terminators. So terminators determine where transcription should stop. It tells the preliminaries where to, where to finish its activity. And so there are two forms of terminators. So one form of terminator is called row independent terminators. And so when the RNA polymerase, what we call RNAP, is producing the mRNA, at some point it'll reach the terminator, the row independent terminator. And it'll form this hairpin where there are very tight GC hydrogen bonding interactions that basically will form a hairpin that physically will block the RNAP from proceeding forward with producing that, that uh, mRNA. And so it's called row independent because it doesn't require what we call the row factor. And so the other terminator are row dependent terminators, where there is a part of the mRNA sequence that's being produced that the row factor, which is this protein here, will be able to bind to. And then that will physically block RNAP from, from, from proceeding forward with the transcriptional process. And so you can pick which kind of terminator you want based on, I guess, the organism you want to express it in that may not have the row factor. So in that situation, you would want to use a row independent terminator that doesn't require some other uh, system endogenous to, to the cell. Now, the promoter and the terminator, those were transcriptionally related parts. Let's talk about the translational related parts. So the RBS is probably the most important one. And the RBS is what's used to initiate protein production. And in traditional molecular biology classes, they also like to call it the Schein-Dalgarno sequence based on of its discoverers. So the RBS, it's complementary to to a sequence within the rRNA that's inside pro, uh, ribosomes. So ribosomes are comprised of two parts that look a little bit like this. So these, this is the same part being rotated. And so when these two parts combine together in what is a kind of a cute little hug, uh, and they kind of have rRNA incorporated into it to hold it all together, then that's when you get a functional unit of ribosome that can then go on to, to translate your mRNA into the actual protein. So you can see here, the mRNA is being fed into this bigger ribosome. And then from it, you have the tRNAs bringing your amino acids to the ribosome. And you get this growing polypeptide chain forming and coming out of the ribosome. And so once you reach the stop codon of the mRNA, the end of the ORF, that's when the ribosome will disengage uh, and kind of disassemble to release the polypeptide that can then go through the whole folding process, which is a completely different topic. Similar to how promoters have consensus uh, sequences for its minus 35 at minus 10 region, RBSs also have a consensus sequence, at least within E. coli. It is going to be AGG, AGG. I like to call it the AG-AG sequence. And sometimes you can see it uh, literally in, in the DNA sequence you have when you have a file for your gene. And so the consensus RBS sequence is important because it tells us how you can also determine the strength of, of RBSs. And so if you look here, for example, you have different, different um, RBSs that when you kind of align all of them, the consensus is going to be AG-AG. And they're typically this particular distance away from the start codon. It ranges from 6 to 8, 6 to 10 sometimes, uh, from the start codon, which is ATG, or in the RNA form, AUG. So RBSs have, uh, just like promoters, they have different strengths. And again, just like promoters, the strength of the RBS is related to the binding affinity between the physical pieces of mRNA with the ribosome. So I said before that the rRNA has a, like a specific sequence within it that will bind to the sequence of the RBS if they're complementary to each other. So the, the better the complementarity, the better the actual binding event. And that way ribosomes can really stick onto that mRNA to make the polypeptide. 
if we have weak RBSs, they won't form strong interactions. And so they're more likely to kind of fall apart and disassemble without production of any polypeptide. And what's also really important is the distance of the RBS from the start codon. And there's some kind of optimization in this, and it really depends on, on the RBS that you're working with and what microbe you're working with. And so for E. coli, there's probably going to be some kind of spacing between six to 10 RBS, sorry, six to 10 nucleotides between the RBS and between the start codon. So there's something called, I want to introduce, this is a really useful tool for, for synthetic biologists or for anyone who's trying to modify the strength of their, of their RBS. It's called the RBS calculator from the Salas lab, uh, Howard Salas. And what it allows you to do is for when you have a gene where you're trying to identify where the RBS is, it can predict the RBS and, and kind of predict the strength of it. And to do that, it needs to have uh, the DNA sequence upstream and downstream of, of the RBS. What it could also do is generate RBSs, new ones, uh, that have varying strengths and translations that have different binding affinities to these ribosomes. And that's very useful for when you want to control the rate of expression. Sometimes, again, you might have toxic proteins that you want there to be a low uh, number of abundance of. So you want weaker promoters and weaker RBSs. And so the RBS calculator can kind of do that for you. And the cool thing with this, it's called de novo DNA. It used to be called just the RBS calculator, which you can see here. But the de novo DNA site has other tools too. And I kind of very quick, kind of timidly show it over here, but the operon calculator is very useful because for operons, they have multiple ORFs and these RBSs they can be kind of hard to determine where they are because sometimes they're, they're located within the ORF just upstream. And so the operon calculator lets you predict where these RBSs are and therefore determine the overall rate of expression, rate of translation of your proteins from that particular operon. The other translational unit, the other part that's related to, to translation are degrons, or also called protein degradation tags, or also called uh, just simply degradation tags. So degrons are going to affect the protein levels in the cell by having post-translational effects. So it's different from the RBS, because the RBS, if you modify the strength of the RBS, you change the amount of protein being produced. The degron is going to be produced from that RBS with that entire polypeptide chain. But after the protein is produced and folded, this, this PDT, this degron, has an effect of degrading the protein at, at a certain rate. So what happens is that the protein degradation tag, the degron, is recognized by a cell's protease system. And cells naturally have protease systems to kind of break apart their old proteins that aren't working anymore, and also proteins that, um, that, that are destined to be recycled. And so in, in cells, they have, for example, the clit P system in E. coli, these protease system that forms this barrel structure. This is the side view, and this is the top view. What you can see is a hole that the, the protease will be able to use to pull in proteins that are tagged with the PDT. And so when it pulls it inside, it'll go through some proteolytic cleavage of your polypeptide chain to degrade this polypeptide back to its monomer form uh, of just amino acids that can be reused by the cell. So protease systems can be endogenous, meaning they're, they're naturally found in the bacteria, and degrons can be also engineered. So let's talk about one of the, the most used uh, degrons systems. And so for this particular figure, what we can begin by looking at is this interaction of, of proteins right here. So you have GFP being produced from, from some promoter, and it's going to be tagged. That's why you have these little yellow tails hanging off. And so these are protein degradation tags that are going to be able to be recognized by a protease called the MF-LON. So the MF-LON protease, it's different from CLIP-P, but they're kind of analogous. They're kind of cousins to each other. The proteins will recognize this specific sequence of the tag. And so if you have ATC present in your solution, the E. coli can uptake the ATC and that can activate expression of your mf line protease. So normally there's GFU being produced, you see a green signal. When you add ATC, 
it will produce the protease to degrade the entire GFP pool into its uh, basic broken down components. And what you'll see is actually that GFP, uh, the signal from it will drop, or, or sometimes your, your cells will become less green over time. And so what that looks like in a figure is like this. On the y-axis, you have the amount of fluorescence normalized to 100%. And over time, you can see that for different degradation tags, they have different rates of repression of the fluorescence or reduction of the fluorescence. And that's based on the fact, again, of the binding affinity between the degron and the protease protein, these physical interactions. So you can engineer the, 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 the literal amino acid sequence of your PDT to effectively alter the rate of degradation of your protein. And so you get less and less protein over time, depending on the increasing strength of the protein. And that can be very useful because when we mathematically model the, this whole process of, of translation, there is going to be a term designated for the ribosome binding site producing the protein. And there's also a term in, in, the, in, the, in the equation of protein production that represents the degradation of the protein. And so previously, before people engineered degrons, uh, the degradation term was just kind of an estimated variable based on the natural rate of, of, of protein degradation. But now by introducing engineered degrons, we can actually modify this term to change the effective protein production by, by increasing the degradation or decreasing it. All right, so that was the, the part of the lecture for talking about the parts and what they are. And briefly in one slide, what I want to talk about is how to predict these parts. And that's like predict, predict these parts in their DNA sequence, because sometimes what happens is that you get a DNA sequence and it's not annotated, meaning that there's no description of what a particular DNA segment will, will produce or what it actually means, like which part of your DNA is the promoter, you know? Because the sequence is just ACTG, a big long chain of it. Uh, without annotation, you can't interpret what part of the DNA does what. And so by predicting parts using these online tools I'll, just, I'll share with you, you can get a better sense of what you're actually looking at. Because again, very often you get a DNA sequence and you have no idea what's going on because there's no annotation. So annotation requires that uh, one of two things, either you, you know what the consensus sequence looks like. So you might look for a TADA box for the promoter you might look for that AG-AG sequence for the RBS, just upstream of your start codon, or you can just use online web tools to help you with this entire process. And sometimes that's way simpler than looking for a needle in a haystack of DNA. So uh, I won't dive into how to use these different software because when you go to these different sites, and it's actually relatively intuitive to use these because you don't have to go to GitHub to download some software that can only be used on Linux programs. Uh, these are these are web servers that you can just input your DNA sequence into and it'll predict for you. So for promoters, I recommend BPROM and Pepper from, from software and from the University of Groningen. And for predicting terminators, there's fine term. For RBSs, I mentioned it before, you can go to the RBS calculator, which is now called the de novo DNA uh, site from the Salus lab. And for ORFs, there's a couple of ways to do this. Uh, as I'll introduce later in Benchling, it can help you with finding ORFs, but you can also use NCBI's ORF founder or the SMS ORF founder. And I'm going to introduce SMS really quickly. Um, if you go to this site, you can literally just Google uh, this particular like phrase in, in your Google search, and then you get to the site. And there is so many different bioinformatics tools that you could use at this site. It's all listed on the left-hand side. So feel free to check it out uh, and see what you can do with that, with those different tools. And when it comes to parts, as I've been talking about for the past forever, um, to one place to look for parts is the IGEM registry for, for standard biological parts. So in this registry, they have uh, a big um, a catalog, basically, of parts from promoters, RBSs to some ORFs and some composite parts as well. And and to varying extents, these parts will have some form of characterization from iGEM teams typically. And I will say right now that the characterization for these parts is a bit spotty 
some some parts are extremely well characterized, whereas some have uh, questionable uh, science being done on them. But with that being said, though, you still have access to these this catalog of parts that you can pull from. And I don't think there's much that exists that looks like the registry. So it's definitely a good place to go first look at your parts. And for the iGen teams out there, when you register for the competition as a team, you when you pay the registration fee, that that five thousand six thousand dollars Canadian uh, does get converted into what you have are I think it's three eighty four well plates. There's like six to seven of them of just different uh, parts, like physical DNA that you can actually start working with. And so you have, would have to go to this registry to to look up these parts to see what the DNA sequence is. And hopefully there's good annotation so you can immediately start using it. All right, you have made it to what I think is probably the halfway point of this lecture. I encourage you not to take a break so you kind of absor absorb the material, review it in your head, uh, integrate it into your mental models, what you already know of biology, and just take a break. Maybe get some food, drink some water. And I'm just going to give a little interlude, uh, some story time uh, about my experiences going through iGEM and as well as actually some research experience now in my PhD. Of course, you can skip ahead. You know, you don't have to listen to any of this. Uh, this is like an old man rambling. So for the first story, when I started doing research in iGEM, iGEM was my first position as a researcher. I remember coming in on my first day in my co-op position at the University of Waterloo on their iGEM team. And my supervisor, you know, a senior bachelor student, had given me a napkin, like one of those brown napkins that you find in labs, and scribbled on it with permanent marker, a fine sharpie, was a list of what I needed to combine to do a restriction enzyme digest, the double digest of, of this particular plasmid. Uh, you know, I didn't know what a restriction enzyme was or how to, I didn't even know what a protocol was. I used to think of them as procedures like you have in kitchens, but there's specific names for them, like protocols or whatever. Anyway, iGEM is a, is a big learning experience where you, you learn to self-learn. And it, it turns out that in grad school, self-learning is integral to your entire program experience. So for the iGEM students out there, those who are thinking of joining iGEM teams, I encourage you to go through the iGEM research progress because it'll help you self-learn. And self-learning is indeed a skill you need in grad school because nothing is taught to you in grad school aside from your courses, sure, maybe some mentorship through your postdoc or senior PhD students, but a lot of it will rely on you and your efforts in reading material and doing the Google searches, the web of science searches, and doing this whole thing by yourself. So when you're, again, going through your graduate experiences, really immerse yourself into the process of being a scientist, an independent one, uh, where you're kind of looking for, for information on your own. And so what I'm showing in this picture is me having gone through uh, perhaps three to four months of iGEM uh, over the summer. And, you know, everything I have on this whiteboard, I had no idea what it was talking about when I first started. And as I progressed through designing experiments with my mentors, thank God bless them. I, I learned so much from them. You know, in these three months, I was able to interpret what these IDT documents we were talking about. These are uh, these are gene block documents. I could formulate experimental plans by myself. Even the tip boxes, they became much more comfortable to me just holding them and working with them. It's things as simple as that. And so take the time to immerse yourself in this experience and really learn from the people around you and work with people around you. <laughs> so so in my in my next experience, uh, what you see in the background is my lab over in Wahlberg in the chemist department at U of T. And there you have me being OG gangster with my uh, with my summer student, Howie. And there you see a picture of him holding up uh, uh, three, so not three, nine SDS gels that he did by himself. And so Howie is amazing because in a month span, uh, in, in just, I think in th four weeks, he was able to go from having done no protein expression and purification all the way to being able to do it entirely by himself in four weeks. And I'm amazed by this. And I encourage the people who are interested in teaching other students to really focus in on what the student already knows and building on that, building that mental model, expanding on it. And this is what we call a cognitive approach in pedagogy. 
where you really pay attention to what the student already knows and you kind of develop them, them in a very uh, careful, nurturing manner. So a funny thing that Howie and I did was in this progress of him rapidly learning the, these methods and the background behind them, uh, I ordered walkie talkies from Amazon. And so he and I would communicate with walkie talkies and that was my way of trying to get him to leave the nest that was my mentorship and get him to do things by himself. And if he had a question, he could just walkie talkie me and ask me as I'm in the office or do my own thing. Uh, and I encourage mentors who might be watching this to do this with your students, uh, to get walkie talkies and communicate that with your students to encourage independence. You wanna encourage situated learning, which is another uh, pedagogical approach where you put them in the position of being the actual researcher. Anyway, I don't wanna read too much about pedagogy, but as you can see, this was a very fun summer for Howie and I, Howie learned a lot. Uh, and I learned a lot from teaching him too. And he also purified proteins for me, which is uh, really helpful. So thank you, Howie. At any rate, let's return back to the lecture now. Hopefully you've taken a break and get ready to learn more about molecular cloning. All right, let's move on to the next section. So in this section, we're gonna play with DNA or at least talk about how to play with the DNA in the form of copying and pasting it. And so when you look to electrical engineering and you look to working with electrical devices, when you put different parts together, so motors, batteries, resistors, insulators, all sorts of things, you're able to actually get properly working constructs. Um, and so we're gonna borrow again, a lot of terminology from this field. And I want you to again, to focus now on the conceptual understanding of how to do these DNA assembly methods, such that when you look at protocols, you can get a better sense of what's going on and what's the purpose of different reagents in the, in the ingredients list and different steps in the whole protocol. We begin by talking about PCR, which stands for polymerase chain reaction. And you might've heard of it. It's what allows you to copy DNA and mass produce it from one, uh, theoretically from a very small sample size. And so let's talk about the intuition behind PCR. Now, to work with a segment of DNA, you, you typically need a lot of it. And specifically, you want to have at least 50 nanograms per microliter. You can definitely work with it much lower, but with 50 nanograms per microliter, you can actually do uh, some pretty easy stuff. Uh, and so this concentration value, I'm talking about 50 nanograms per microliter, it's determined by a process called nanodrop. And so for to, to learn more about nanodrop, I refer you to Joseph's video where he talks about some basic molecular biology techniques in more detail, uh, but you would use a nanodrop to, to determine the concentration. Now, if you don't have 50 nanograms per microliter of DNA or more, say you have one nanogram and you want more of it. So you would use PCR to make more copies and you would use it with a thermocycler. And there are different thermocyclers that can be used from Eppendorf, Biorad, uh, but generally they all work on the same principle where you're going to repeat a bunch of different cycles that have temperatures that will allow for the reagents in your PCR setup to do the copying of your DNA. So let's talk about it, generally speaking. In PCR, we begin with a small sample of DNA on the left-hand side. And so combined with the sample of your DNA that you want to replicate and mass produce, you have primers and nucleotides. And what these will do is allow you to keep building new copies of your, of your target DNA. And so when you have this whole setup done, you go through the thermocycling process, which goes through three steps that will cycle over and over again. Step one is denaturing at 94 to 96 degrees, or even 100 degrees in some cases. And what denaturing will do is this part right here. It will separate your double-stranded DNA into two linear single-stranded pieces of DNA. And the separation is created because this higher temperature breaks apart the hydrogen bonding. You can imagine if you boil water, water evaporates, you get some steam when you boil the DNA sample, basically, you, you break apart those hydrogen bonds, same concept. And by breaking it apart, you allow for the primer, which is what you will have to design yourself, to be complementary to parts of the DNA that you want to amplify, to make copies of. And so to allow for the primers to stick to this DNA, you lower the temperature in the annealing phase. And it's called annealing because you're annealing together the primer and this DNA. 
And so it's unlikely that the DNA will come back together to the original form because the temperature is specified such that only the primer can actually bind and not the entire piece of DNA. And so the primer binds to the sites where you want to amplify from. So in this case, you might want to amplify your co and copy your segment of DNA from this point onward. So you design, in this case, the forward primer to move in this direction. And that's how you get this step in your elongation phase at 72 degrees. So you increase the temperature now so that the polymerase that's in your reaction is able to make the DNA similar to how DNA replication happens. And the reverse is going on in the opposite side of the strand. So in, in, in phase three or stage three, you get elongation. So I don't want to walk through like all the subsequent steps and exactly what's going on, but this is kind of the intuition behind how it happens. As you repeat these cycles over and over again, because once you get to this point, you go back to stage one, you repeat this up to 25 to 35 cycles, and by the end of it, it goes to an exponential growth, and you will get exponentially more of your DNA copy as you go. So typically, we recommend like 25 to 35, but what's a good starting point is 20 to 30 cycles, and then you can adjust from there uh, based on how much DNA you want. So as I said, you repeat this 25 to 35 times. Now, what happens after you finish going through these cycles is there's a step called the final extension, which is basically step three is this exact same thing, except it's much more prolonged. It's typically five to 10 minutes in order to allow for any unfinished uh, uh, replications to finish up, to ensure that all the product you have is the exact DNA segment that you want and not some shortened version that didn't have enough time to fully elongate. And then after that, uh, typically you can bring it back down to room temperature, but if you want to store it overnight because you're running a PCR overnight, uh, you leave it at 16 or four degrees. And you typically want to do this overnight, especially when you have really long uh, cycles. Say a cycle takes five minutes, or no, say a cycle takes like 15 minutes and you need to do it 35 times, you might want to just leave it overnight to save you time to do other stuff, like sleep. So the useful thing about PCR is that the primers can be used to amplify uh, your segment of DNA. But if you want to add what we call overhangs uh, to put on adapters to the ends of your DNA, so that these adapters allow your DNA to be put into something else or combined with something else, we have what we call uh, overhangs that you can add to primers. So in this case, this is a normal PCR. In this case, this is uh, it's still normal PCR, but now your primers have overhangs. And so the way PCR will work is that as you go through the cycles, it will actually make your, 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 your target DNA, but it'll append these particular overhangs onto it. And so we'll talk about what the overhangs can be used for in a couple of slides in, coming up, uh, but they can be used to allow for you to do some, some assembly of DNA constructs. Next, let's talk about pasting DNA. This is gonna be a couple of slides where we're gonna talk about how to put DNA constructs, or sorry, DNA segments together into what we call constructs. Uh, this is different from the terminology of genes, parts, devices, systems, because we're talking about the physical pieces of the DNA. And so let's start by kind of looking at the intuition behind how DNA comes together. And so DNA is a sequence of base pairs, uh, which we shorten as BPS for simplicity. And so these base pairs are, are AT being paired together and CG being paired together. And so it helps to think of DNA segments as Lego blocks that can click together. If you ever played with Lego blocks, you can, it's satisfying seeing uh, the pieces fit together so nicely. And so have that kind of thinking when you're talking about DNA because it makes it much more intuitive to look at DNA. So say we look at this particular segment of DNA, where we have on the top the 503 prime and the bottom is the complementary strand. So if you look at the beginning of TAGC, picture that as a Lego block, where each of these different circles is a nucleotide. Now you can imagine that in order to put the, the complementary DNA strand, the ATCG on the bottom, 
you need to find a Lego block, a piece of DNA that actually matches properly. So you, you, if you find like Lego blocks that look like this, you know, this will not match and stick to this. And this also will not match and stick to this. I mean, the CG will stick here, but this part will actually kind of uh, bump into each other and not actually interact. It's the same case for this. A T might stick here, but the GC is the same here. So it actually will not complement and again, bump into each other. What you need is a piece of DNA, another Lego piece, that's actually complementary. And so in this case, you can imagine this Lego block could actually fit here properly. And actually you can get that whole uh, sandwich block together. And when we talk about pitting DNA together, this clicking motion, um, I want to remind you that I'm specifically referring to the terms assembling and disassembling DNA constructs. And when we're talking about it based on this clicking motion, the clicking motion is an abstract concept. I went, based on reality, this clicking is referring to the fact that DNA is comprised of this phosphate backbone, and with each phosphate, there is a nucleotide that interacts through hydrogen bonding with another nucleotide. So for A and T, they form two hydrogen bonds, and for, as you can see here, and for CG, they form a triple hydrogen bond. And this difference between two and three is actually really important because it determines the melting temperature for a particular segment of DNA. And that's particularly pertinent when you design primers for PCR, because the more GC you have, because it, it, it's binding more tightly, the, the higher the temperature required to break apart these hydrogen bonds. And so in general, when we talk about clicking, we're talking about optimum uh, hydrogen bonding, the proper orientation and the proper interactions between AT and CG. And DNA is typically, when we talk about it, is going to be double-stranded DNA. And so it can be linear, it can be circular, and when it's circular double-stranded DNA, we can also describe it as coiled or supercoiled. But those aren't really important until we start working with uh, uh, specifics for electrophoresis. But going back to the linear and the circular double-stranded DNA, as I've shown you before, this is an example of double-stranded DNA. And so we call this a fragment because it's a fragment of DNA. Now, circular double-stranded DNA, we typically call it plasmids. And so plasmids, as I'll explain, they have three components to them that allow you to work with DNA segments for longer periods of time and more specifically for, for functional expression of your, of your DNA construct. So let's talk about that more specifically. So most of bacteria have their genetic material found in the actual chromosome, which expands on the orders of millions of base pairs. But for plasmids, they typically span on the order of thousands of base pairs, and they, they are called extra chromosomal genetic elements because they're not particularly mandatory for the survival of the cell, uh, unless it's under certain conditions. And so plasmids can be used to be uh, exchanging genetic material between bacterial species. So you can imagine if there's an antibiotic in, in, in the environment, and you know one bacterial species has a resistance gene to prevent any any killing effect from the from the antibiotic. Well, maybe it has a symbiotic relationship with another bacteria, and that bacteria doesn't have any resistance to the an antibiotic, so it'll die. What bacteria can do is go through a process of horizontal gene transfer, the process of transferring its genetic material in its plasmid with its resistance gene to something else that it wants to work with. And so now suddenly that bacterial species has its resistance gene. And so this is, this is, this is actually a problem with antibiotic uh, resistance uh, in, in, in bacteria, but that's not the point of this. At any rate, plasmids are naturally found, but they've been engineered. And so in the 1980s, uh, what I call the OG plasmid, the first artificial plasmid, at least I think it is, um, is PUC-19. And so PUC-19 was developed by Joe Messing at Rutgers University. And so PUC-19 has some specific properties inside of it. Uh, as I mentioned before, it has a, an ORI, a selectable marker, and what we call the MCS, which I'll explain in just a sec. But what plasmids allow scientists to do is to transfer new properties to, to bacteria for biotechnological purposes. So in particular, there are kind of two uses to plasmids. Plasmids can be used as cloning vectors and as expression vectors. For cloning vectors, 
That's referring to the process of pitting your DNA construct into a plasmid in order to store it for long periods of time. Because double-stranded DNA is prone to being degraded by the environment, by bacteria. If you make it circular, it allows it to be much more stable because the ends of those DNAs are now protected because it's just one big circle of plasmid. When you have unprotected overhangs, or not overhangs, but ends of a DNA, they're more likely to be to be degraded by, by the bacteria uh, naturally. And the other use is expression vectors. So when you want your, your, your DNA construct, which is an actual device or system, when you want it to be expressed, you want to use expression vectors typically. And so the simplest expression vectors have one promoter inside of them, like a T7 promoter, and it'll produce a bunch of protein for you. And so the amount of protein you're producing is non-trivial. It's typically a lot of protein. Um, but sometimes you can modify the expression vector to have different expression levels, and that'll allow for more, more precise devices and systems to exist that you can then later characterize in vitro. Now, I mentioned before, the plasma has three major components to it. And what these three major components will do is allow you to, to only have bacteria that have your plasmid, to allow that plasmid to exist through multiple generations of bacteria, because bacteria grow through generations. And it allow you to, as this plasma is being copied and, and propagated, um, it allow you to have that DNA construct also be produced with your plasmid as, as the cells use them. So let's talk about these different things more specifically. Now, we look back to the PUC19 plasmid. First, we have the ampicillin resistance gene, also in this case, just called AMP in an italicized format. So what AMP will do is produce a protein constitutively that, you, that, that will encode for a beta lactamase. And beta lactamases will basically kind of degrade ampicillin so that the ampicillin molecule doesn't have its killing effect on E. coli, and this prevents the E. coli from dying. It allows it to be resistant to this, to this killing molecule. And so these are called selection markers because you can imagine if your E. coli has this AMP gene, then it can survive in the presence of ampicillin. Now, E. coli that we work with in the lab typically don't have natural resistance to ampicillin, so they will die in the presence uh, of ampicillin if they don't have this plasmid. So you kind of force all of your bacteria to have this plasmid. You select for bacteria um, that have the plasmid. The next characteristic is the ORI. The ORI is not a gene, but it's a replication element. It's a DNA element that allows the cell to basically keep making copies of this plasmid. You can imagine that the cell is constantly degrading things over time because it's trying to recycle things. So it might recycle the plasmid. But what the ORI does is it allows for this plasmid to be replicated multiple times and propagated into the future generations of, of the bacteria when the bacteria is itself dividing. So the interesting thing about ORIs is that they can be modified and engineered to have different copy numbers. And when I talk about copy numbers, and when synthetic bi biologists mention it, we're talking about high copy and low copy. Uh, and quite intuitively, low copy ORIs will only make a few number of plasma molecules, typically one to 10. High copy uh, ORIs will generate anywhere from like 50 to hundreds of, of, of the plasmid within one bacteria, so you can get more, more of it. And you typically see high copy plasmids for cloning vectors where your, your focus is storing the DNA and mass producing it so you can work with it. Whereas sometimes for um, for some expression vectors where you might be expressing toxic proteins, they have lower copy numbers so that you don't have too many copies of your gene and therefore leading to too much of your protein being produced. The second thing is called the polylinker region or the multiple cloning site. And so the, for the PUC19, it has a special kind of polylinker where you put your DNA construct into it that is located in the LAXZ alpha gene. And so what this gene is, it encodes for an enzyme. And what this enzyme will do is metabolize a special compound you will add to the media that you're growing this bacteria on. And so when it metabolizes it, it turns this compound that is naturally colorless into a blue compound. And so you can literally see blue. So any time there's a cell 
colony on your plate that is blue, it means that nothing is inside this polylinker. Now, when you put your DNA construct into the polylinker where it's supposed to go, you basically disrupt the expression of the laxid alpha. So you get no proper expression of laxid alpha. And as a result, it can't metabolize this special compound in the media from blue, uh, from, from, from its colorless form to blue. And so when you successfully get your DNA construct in the polylinker, your colonies actually become white, colorless. And so you can, you can, you can quite easily differentiate on your plate from, from colonies that don't have your construct, which are blue, from colonies that do have your construct, which are white, and you can work with those white colonies moving forward. And so, uh, and, and more generally speaking, this is this PUC-19 system. Not all expression vectors or vectors in general or plasmids will have this laxid alpha polylinker setup. Sometimes they just have a polylinker that you can put your DNA into it using methods like restriction enzymes. And now this brings us to restriction enzymes. So we're going to talk about how to put DNA together through different assembly methods. The most basic way to do this is through restriction enzymes and a process called ligation-dependent cloning. I'll explain what that means in a sec. Now, restriction en enzymes are they're basically DNA scissors. They're not the scissors that are straight edge that can cut anything. They're scissors that have those specific weird kind of patterns to them. Um, and so restriction enzymes recognize poly palindromic sequences. So the same way race car spelled backward is still a race car. Well, if you look at some DNA sequence like this one over here, um, NDEI is a cut site that is represented by this particular DNA sequence. That's a palindromic sequence. So if you spelt this thing backwards, the, the C A T A T G part, that's the complementary part. It's G T A G T A T A C. It's it's the it's the reverse. And so restriction enzymes have evolved to recognize different sites. And so in this particular site, it's N D E I, and it cuts right here, going across, and right down here. And so you can imagine by cutting in this particular way, if you have uh, another plasmid that was also cut here, then you can see how they can stitch back together. And so this kind of cut is called an overhang cut. And it's called an overhang cut because once you cut like this, well, the remaining part of the DNA here has the TA kind of sticking out and nothing complementing it. And the other end of the DNA, the front end, has AT just sticking out and nothing complementing it because it's been cut and separated. Remember that the phosphate backbone is one contiguous sequence. When I say cutting, you're breaking apart that phosphate backbone to separate the, the DNA. Now, if we look at PUC19, and, and earlier I talked about the polylinker region. Well, if you look more closely at the actual DNA sequence, the polylinker region looks like this. And you can see that there's different cut sites. And so the DNA sequence of a, is, of course, not repetitive, and which is saying that each of these cut sites recognize a different part of the DNA. So you can imagine, so NDEI is not within this particular polylinker, so it can't actually make it in. But these all have different ways of cutting. So if you were to cut this DNA segment and each end had, say, equal RI and HIN3I on the front and the back, respectively, well, if you cut the, the PUC19 vector at equal RI and HIN3, then you can imagine you can put this piece of DNA that has the same ends cut into the PUC19, and that's how you would insert it into the polylinker using restriction enzymes. And so, as I mentioned before, with the idea of designing primers that have overhangs, those overhang, those extra base pairs kind of dangling off, well, the DNA sequence for, for that overhang can simply be a restriction site. So say you have this insert, this DNA segment, this fragment, that is by itself not able to be put in here, well, you can amplify more of this insert using PCR and design primers to add equal RI to the green area here and add HIM3, which is represented by the blue area here. And this will allow it to be put into a vector like PUC19 that is also cut with equal RI and HIM3I, just because of how these overhangs will kind of stitch back and click together. And so when you have put together the insert with the vector, uh, in, in the experimental part, we call those constructs.
constructs refers to vectors that were previously empty, but filled with an insert. Now let's look, kind of look at it uh, more, more specifically. So say you have your cloning vector, this could be Puck19, for example, and this is one restriction enzyme site that is recognized by EcoRI. Well, if you, if you expose this, this, this plasmid to EcoRI, it will make a cut like this that has an overhang. And so this overhang might come back together temporarily, but typically it'll be free flowing and dangling as one big long double-stranded linear DNA. Now, as I said before, you might have a piece of DNA that you want to put into this cloning vector. But what you can do is have an adapter that kind of sticks onto the end. So previously I mentioned you can use primers to add new overhangs, but you can also just use something called ligase, which doesn't require overhangs. It, can, it just requires these blunt ends and it'll just stitch them together. And you can imagine if you have this stick to each end to make it look like this, well, if you cut it with EcoRI, it has now overhangs that look like this. And you can see how this can be put into this. It can be annealed together such that this AATT that's hanging off will complement and stick to this part here. And the same for the other end. And so when they stick together, it's kind of temporary. What you need is a process called ligation or using an enzyme called ligase. And the ligase will actually stitch the phosphate backbone back together. And that's how you are able to get this construct where in this case, both sides agree because they're the same adapter. You can get an insert into a vector this way. And so I want you to take a careful look. So when there's a gap there that you can see, that gap represents the fact that this phosphate from this end of the nucleotide, it can't just form a, a, a reaction with the hydroxide and reconnect the phosphate backbone. You need to have ligase do that for you because it requires energy through ATP to do that. And so through the process, you get ligation. And only then here do you have these, these spaces disappear and you have one contiguous uh, circular piece of DNA. Okay, so I wonder if you noticed the differences. So I, I drew these two different pictures for you. Um, and the, the difference between them is the way I colored the ends. And what that's trying, I'm trying to represent the fact that these are different restriction enzyme sites between the green and the blue. And so when you do this form of, of assembly, this is called a double digest. And what it allows for is for your insert of DNA to get into the vector in a specific orientation. You can imagine that this piece of DNA if you were to flip it 180 the other way around and have the blue end match up with the green, well, the DNA overhang isn't actually going to match each other. And so they will not actually combine. You can only combine in this orientation. If you look to the right-hand side, this is called a single digest, where the end here is basically going to be cut in such a way where it can enter either way because it's the same restriction enzyme site. And so it's very important that you design primers that will add on the correct sites so you have proper orientation. Now, single digest you see more commonly with cloning vectors because you're just using the cloning vector to store the DNA. It doesn't matter where the orientation is, is pointing at. But for double digest, you can imagine it's very important because there might be a promoter in this case for expression vectors that only expresses in this direction. So if you have your, your ORF going in to the vector the other way around, well, you might not get any protein at all. And it's important to make this distinction. And as I've been talking, there has been decades of research going into discovering new restriction enzymes, especially from companies that supply these reagents to labs and sell them. So NAB has this gigantic list that I just <laughs> zoomed through. But in this list, you can see that uh, there's different restriction enzymes, like hundreds, and there's different properties to them. Uh, you can deactivate them. So when you don't want the, the process of cutting to be too prolonged, because you might start cutting off-site, uh, you, can, you can stop the reaction by boiling or heating the reaction up to 65 or 85 degrees. And there's also optimum temperatures to run it at, and there's optimum buffers to run the reaction at.
Now you can imagine, and if you start playing with this idea of restriction enzymes matching each other, who's to say that you have to only be restricted to one insert? You can have, in this case, three inserts where the restriction enzymes being added onto these different inserts allow for them to be assembled in this particular orientation. And you can imagine that each of these inserts could be a separate device that when all three are together can form an actual system to carry out some complex task. Now, the issue here is that say you have multiple inserts, well, then you will need different restriction enzymes cutting at, in this case, four places. And sometimes you can't easily work with four enzymes all at once because they're incompatible with each other. Some might need buffers that are different from others. And so you, it just really complicates the whole process in the lab. What really helps is a process where you can just use one restriction enzyme to cut everything all at once and stitch everything back together, but still have proper orientation. So let me introduce the next method, which is called MOCLO or molecular cloning, uh, but specifically golden gate cloning. So MOCLO still uses restriction enzymes, but it's going to now use just one to cut all of the parts, but still somehow put it into a specific orientation. And let me show you this magic. So I mentioned before, the NDEI cut site looks like this, and it's special in a sense that its recognition site is the same as its cut site. So here's a recognition site, and there's the cut site. This is what we call congruent. Now, BSAI cut sites, so they're what we call type 2 restriction cut sites. And so the recognition site is different from the cut site. And the N in this case is representing the fact that it recognizes a specific sequence, and then it'll cut in this pattern regardless of what nucleotide is downstream. And that's going to be very important, as you'll see. So let's walk through how Golden Gate Assembly works, how MoCLO works. So we start by looking at here. This is the destination vector that we want our DNA construct, our device, devices to eventually end up into. And so it's going to have these cut sites inside of it in two different places. And so we might want to put two different inserts, two devices into this vector. And to do that, what we're going to need to have are overhangs four different overhangs in this case. So in this one overhang, it's going to encode for, for a BSAI site or some type 2S cut site, the type 2 restriction enzyme. And you want to adapt it such that uh, it'll stick onto the orange on this end, and it'll have this particular sequence. Uh, we will just call it colored green, but the green re represents like a particular DNA sequence. Uh, on the other side, it might have the yellow overhang, and then you, if, you, if you add these different overhangs in this configuration, what you can do is when you cut with the BSAI site, you cut all this and all this in one single single tube, get all of this together being cut with one site. Well, it'll cut in this particular form. So on one side, you have the green. When you have the blue, this corresponds to this right here. And the inserts that you want to put in this orange and purple block well, they will be cut in this particular format. And I encourage you to pause the video and look at this very carefully. Because what you can do now is, as I showed you before with those three inserts in the three previous slide, well, this can now just stitches, stitches back together. And what you can do is when you ligate everything, you're able to get the assembled plasmid in this particular format. And remember that previously in the last slide, we used four different restriction enzymes cutting three to four pieces of DNA to put it together. Well, in this case, we're using we're only using one enzyme to simplify the entire process, but we're actually designing this N sequence such that they're actually going to be complementary to each other because they're the parts that are being cut, not the actual cut site, uh, recognition sites in the gray. So that's a MoClo. That's how you would put multiple parts together in a simple uh, manner that has the least number of steps possible. So MoCLO and restriction enzymes, these methods require ligase in order for you to re-stitch together the phosphate backbone so you have one contiguous piece of DNA. Now, the ligase reaction can sometimes take quite a long time. 
commercial suppliers will advertise that it might take 30 minutes, five minutes sometimes. But in practice, what I've found at least is that ligation reactions can occur more effectively at room temperature and over the entire night, or maybe at 16 degrees overnight. And that ensures that all of your plasmas are properly formed so you can transform it, which we'll talk about in a bit, uh, into E. coli so E. coli can uptake the plasmid. Now, that can be very time consuming. There are other methods that now exist called ligation independent cloning, or more specifically Gibson, that don't require this long process of ligation. So rather than ligase, ligation independent cloning, otherwise called LIC, uses DNA polymerase. So I'm gonna walk you through the intuition behind how this works. Now, what you first do is go through a PCR reaction. And in this PCR reaction, you're gonna make your insert that, that has your, your, your device or system inside of it. And what you're also going to do, which is not described here, is do the same for the PCR uh, of the backbone. This is called the backbone. It's the plasma that is going to be, receive your insert. And by PCRing both the insert and the vector, you linearize both ends. Now, after every PCR, you do a little bit of cleanup. And then what we're going to do next is form cohesive ends, otherwise known as adding the exonuclease to your DNA linear fragments, and it'll chew up the three prime to five prime ends. So it goes from here and chews a little bit into it. Now, the, the idea is that you design the insert and you design the vector such that when this part is chewed up, they're actually going to be complementary to each other and they'll stick to each other. So you can imagine exit nucleus is cutting and chewing up into this backbone. It doesn't exactly know where to stop, but it'll stop a few base pairs downstream or, or away from the end. And so when you put them to back together, it's very analogous to how primers will stick to its complementary region during a PCR. And that's why we have, in this case, DNA polymerase. Because once they, the overhangs stick back together, there's going to be a chunk of DNA that isn't, that's just single-stranded. And so the part that sticks back together is basically a double primer. Uh, it's, it's a primer without having additional primers that you would have to design in PCR. It, it primes in the direction of that way and also in that way. So you kind of fill up the rest of the remaining chewed up part from the exonuclease reaction. And so that can be done much faster than ligation reactions because you would just have DNA polymerase uh, finishing everything up. And so the DNA polymerase can also form that phosphate bond and so it makes one continuous uh, phosphate backbone. So you have a finished plasma right off the bat right here. And so in this case, it takes two hours and 45 minutes to do the whole process of chewing the backbone, annealing it, and then putting it all back together into one final plasmid. Whereas the ligation can take an overnight reaction of just 16 hours. So, so the time uh, can be very important for some people, but the ligation is actually the simpler way to go. It's just that this is much faster. And so here's an example of using LIC to pick together multiple genes. Now I encourage you to pause the video and look at how these different overhangs being attached are going to overlap with each other. So I'm hoping you pause the video so you can see with gene one, if you add these overhangs, the orange one, when it's chewed up, will create an overhang that will allow it to stick to this part, the front end of your vector, that it has a, a chewed back part as well from the exonuclease. And you can see how these overhangs will now stitch together. And so when they stitch together, you can use DNA polymerase to reform the backbone and replace any nucleotide that was chewed up and removed. And so you would get one contiguous sequence of DNA in your final plasmid. Next, we'll talk about Gibson assembly, which is a variant of ligation independent cloning, LIC. So let's walk through it. In this case, we, we need an exonucleus, just like LIC. We, for Gibson assembly, people like to use fusion polymerase uh, or Q5 polymerase from NEB. And there's also gonna be a ligase, but it's gonna happen a lot faster in this particular reaction. So what's gonna happen is you have an insert that's gonna be destined to be put into this linearized recipient plasmid or vector 
And when it's put together, it'll look like this, one contiguous weak sequence. But now let's talk about how you're actually going to put it together. So to create these overhangs, A and B, well, you would use this primer, A for insert, and this primer, B insert, to amplify this target insert uh, using this, these two. And for the vector, in order to linearize it, you're going to use a PCR reaction where it's going to where you're going to have this A vector plot, uh, primer and this B vector primer going in opposite directions. So it'll amplify in this direction and in this direction, and nothing in between. And that will basically like it'll basically uncircularize your plasma so that it's just one uh, linear piece, such that when you have your insert and you expose it to the nucleus, exonuclease, just like before, you chew up the three prime to five prime direction there and there. And you can see these cute little dots, they kind of will stick back together. And by sticking back together, that's how you use the polymerase and the ligase to have one contiguous piece of, of your of your of your construct. Now the nice thing is that when you're doing Gibson, this is going to be amplified by PCR. Now the interesting thing is that plasmids that this exact that exist naturally they're methylated by CH3 groups all over the plasmid. Now, what you can do is use a DPNI, that's a restriction enzyme, uh, do a digest of DPNI that only cuts methylated sites. So any of the natural uh, uh, original plasmid will be degraded such that in the end, you won't have any re-linearized recipient plasmid. You will only have uh, linearized plasmids containing your insert of interest. So these assembly methods might not be the most intuitive when I first explained it, but they do become more intuitive as you go back in this video and look at how these overhangs are created, typically through, for, through PCR and having overhanging primers. Um, look back at how these overhangs are formed and how you can modify them to have multiple inserts come together. And it really helps when you start working with benchling to see how you can actually work with specific inserts and see how different sequence files can then match together based on based off of these overhangs. Now, one method I want to introduce that I won't go into too much detail just because it requires uh, me to actually draw what's going on because it's a lot of imagination that is too much for an introductory course or, le or lecture. But stitching PCR can allow you to remove small and gigantic chunks of DNA, but also allow you to put in small and large chunks of DNA as well. And so I recommend you look at how to do stitching PCR because this method is only going to use PCR reagents. You don't need to buy Gibson assembly mixes. You don't need to buy a special LIC mixes or any B. Doesn't require restriction enzymes. It just requires you to, to design the overhang of primers very uh, precisely. And that's why it's dedicated for another video. It deserves another video because uh, primer design is something that I'm assuming you have some understanding of what it is. So we'll do a separate video for you in case you don't, but that's coming up in the future. Now I've been talking about copying and pasting. These are different assembly methods, PCR, uh, to work with DNA. What I haven't talked about is how to edit DNA that already exists. So for the biochemist and the experimentalist, the, the most straightforward way to do any editing is through a process called site-directed mutagenesis, which in the field we call SDM. And so SDM can be applied to plasmids um, in, this, in the sense that you can modify specific base pairs or a set of base pairs. Um, and you can do that through a, a method called, um, I think it's called quick change. If you Google that, you can find that protocol. Now, if you're in the city of Toronto, if you're in Ontario, or, or even in Canada in general, you can contact Renomics, which is a co company based in Toronto, and they will do the SDM for you if you give them your plasmid that you want to modify. It, it does obviously cost some money, uh, but it's under 100 bucks for each mutation. And as you do more mutations, they have discounts. And so they can produce massive libraries of SDMs for you uh, to do a lot of mutational studies. Now, those are for plasmids. If you want to modify and edit the, the genome, well, then you're looking at CRISPR 
uh, because it's much more specific compared to restriction enzymes. Because you can imagine in a genome, there might be multiple restriction enzymes and you're just gonna be cutting all over the place. Well, CRISPR is a little bit more specific or rather it's much more specific. And so I will refer you to the next lecture where Marios will walk you through what CRISPR is, how it works at a molecular level, and perhaps how you can use it in different applications. Now we're going to move to the third section, where we're going to talk about briefly what cell-free expression is. So there's a little bit less terminology now. Now I want you to start applying some of your conceptual understanding and knowledge of genes and parts and assembly methods. And what we're going to do now is talk about what to do with the actual constructs. All right, so you got your final construct where you put your insert or inserts into your vector, whether it's a cloning vector or an expression vector. Well, now you want to actually use these devices, these systems, and you want to do that by putting it into the E. coli to do the whole transcription translation business. So typically we will use E. coli in the molecular biology lab for these things. And so to put the plasmid into the E. coli, um, there's a couple of ways to do this. So in the first way, it's called chemical transformation. And so what we use is calcium chloride or rubidium chloride to help increase the permeability of the membrane of these cells. So you can kind of see that down here in this particular figure, we begin with the chemically competent cell that has been treated with calcium chloride and rubidium chloride. And it's called chemically competent, chemically referring to its chemicals and competent, meaning that it's, it's ready to take up to plasmid. So what you do is you incubate your chemically competent cells with your plasmid uh, at typically at four degrees or on ice. And so that kind of allows the plasmids to settle onto the surface of, of your chemically competent cell. And it's kind of sitting there, it's resting. What, we, what you do, and, and this is very important for chemical transformation is uh, you allow it to sit for like an hour. Uh, typically 30 minutes is sufficient. I think Marios has done it in an even shorter time in like 20 minutes or something. I don't trust, but you guys can try it. And you then heat shock it at uh, 42 degrees for 30 seconds up to, I've done a minute and 30 seconds to really shock it for a long period of time. And by shocking it, you actually kind of increase the permeability of the membrane to allow for kind of pores to exist transiently, not forever. For the plasmids that are kind of coiled or super coiled, they kind of just slip into the, the E. coli. And you go through a recovery phase where, you know, you've shocked it, you let it sit for like five minutes or something, and then you, you add fresh LB media, uh, LB stands for Luria, Britanni, it's a type of broth that E. coli like, and you let it incubate for like an hour so that it can uptake the plasmid fully and start expressing some of that antibiotic resistance marker. Uh, or gene, so that when you transfer these cells now to the, the amp ampicillin-containing media, for example, it's ready to kind of protect itself and start replicating, so you can produce more of this plasmid for later use. So Joseph will talk about this in his, his in his uh, molecular biology techniques lecture later down the line, but this is kind of the conceptual basis. The the other way to do transformation is through electroporation. So same principle, you have cells that you've, you've modified up through a process that allows them to take up, uh, take up plasmids. So you incubate it a little bit, and instead of using heat shock, we're gonna use an electric shock to shock the cells so the, so the cell membrane is permeable in the same manner. Um, the cells will, will allow the plasmid that's coiled to slip through. Uh, you go through a five minute ice and then you go through some LB incubation and then you get your final product, which is the cell that's ready to be propagated further and further overnight uh, in a 37 degree incubation. So people like to use electroporation because uh, I guess you save like a minute's worth of time of heat shocking um, and rather the recovery time is a lot faster as well. So once the the construct is in your DH5-alpha is the, the, the E. coli we like to use for, for most of our work. Once it's inside, you can now imagine if it's a cloning vector, well, now you can store it inside the fridge for a long time, the freezer. Uh, 
or if it's an expression vector, now you're ready to start mass producing your protein to, to study it further down the line. And so if you're going to do the, the mass protein production, you go through the whole T7 system uh, or some high activity promoter uh, approach. I won't talk about what the T7 system is in this lecture. You're, I recommend Googling it or Wikipedia it. Uh, and if we, we might have a separate video for this. Now, sometimes, and for different applications, you may not care too much about using the plasmid right off the bat to, to store it or to express proteins. Maybe you want to use it as a device to, to act as a sensor, for example. And so I want to introduce what cell-free expression systems are in this third section so you can kind of learn more about it and explore it on your own. So let's talk about it conceptually. Now, rather than using live cells to provide that transcription translational machinery, like the polymerase and the ribosomes, well, what you can do is separate all of this machinery from living cells. So you get that non-living cell lysate, and you can do some processing to remove some toxins uh, to remove unwanted compounds and proteins. But what you end up with is a non-living mixture of the cellular machinery that enables transcription and translation, that enables genetic circuits to be used. And so let's take a look over here, for example. Now, you have like a little reactor system that's going to be producing your E. coli that has your plasma inside of it that's being transformed. You produce a bunch of your biomass and then you can harvest that biomass using centrifugation to, to kind of pellet all of your cells to the bottom of it. And then you can take that cell pellet, lyse it, and get all that cellular machinery out. And with this cellular machinery, you say you want to isolate your protein, for example. In this case, it's GFP that was being produced this entire time. You want to isolate the GFP. Well, now you can just put this entire process into uh, some sort of protein purification protocol to purify your GFP. So this is the natural way you, not natural, this is the, the traditional way you would do protein purification, and in this case with GFP. Now, in the cell-free systems approach, the CFS approach, well, it's going to be a little bit different this time. What you're going to do is go through the process of growing your cells, and this time there's not going to be any plasma inside of it that you've transformed. You're just going to have cells. You grow a bunch of it, you, you harvest the cells by centrifugation and you lyse the cells, you collect all of the cell mach cellular machinery and you do some processing to make sure that you have exactly what you want inside the cell extract and you remove some contaminants such as toxins, for example. And with this cell extract, this is where the magic happens. Well, this cell extract, you can add a few extra components that will enable the cell extract, this non-living system there's no cells in here, they're all dead, they've been lysed. It'll allow for the expression of GFP if you put the plasmid into the cell lysate. It's kind of magical because you can imagine that you can put this cell extract into a piece of paper, like a small little dot on a paper with your plasmid inside of it. And say your plasmid responds to some kind of environmental factor, it's a biosensor of this device, well, you can imagine you've now created a paper diagnostic because you have on this piece of paper all the machinery you need to express this device in response to some kind of blood sample, urine sample, some liquid sample, or even a water sample. And it might cause a color change in this paper disc, for example, because of this device that you, you've, you've put in this plasma you've put in combined with the cell extract. But in this case, for example, what you can do is produce the GFP, and that's one way of, of, of purifying of your GFP. Rather than expressing it inside a bioreactor with living biomass, well, you collect the cell extract that's non-living and use that to express your, your plasmid. And so as I, as I alluded to, you can create these paper-based diagnostics so the cell extract, you can lyophilize it. You can remove as much water as possible from the paper disc such that it's all evaporated. And what you have left on the paper disc embedded inside of it is your cellular machinery and perhaps your devices that will perform some specific function. And so as I said, this is what it looks like. This is from an 
this field is really spurred from, from Jim Collins and Keith Party. And Keith Party is, a, is a, currently a Canadian synthetic biologist at U of T in the department of, or the faculty of pharmacy. And so he, his research has to do with creating these paper-based diagnostics and these, this, these, working with these cell-free systems. And what you can see here, for example, each of these little dots is what I described. It's one dot of lyophilized cell extract with your device inside, where if you give it some sort of, of human sample, water sample, and if there's a presence of some, some, some target molecule that you're interested in that activates your device, well, then you might get a color change that you can detect with some, some, some camera. Uh, and that's largely what their work is. I really, check, I really encourage you to check out their work. It's amazing. Uh, but that's kind of the basis of their work. And so you can see, as I mentioned, the camera device, uh, Sarah and Livia, my friends over here, uh, who, who judged iGEM this past year in 2019, uh, they created this 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 a low cost device, and they've they've created a startup company called LSK Life Science Key Technologies with Keith Party. You can see over here, uh, my man, without facial hair. <laughs> That's funny. Um, you can see them winning different uh, different different uh, prize money from for for their for their company for LSK. So this is one 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 way you can see synthetic biology in action in real life, make an impact. So, so I, as I mentioned, these are, these are paper-based CFS approaches that you can use to express your proteins. And so the devices that are kind of at the forefront that are being used in cell-free systems are going to be triggered by something in the water. And this key word is trigger. So the triggers can be repressors that, that affect operators. As I mentioned before in the second section where I talked about genes and parts, these triggers can also be different. They don't have to be promoters. So I kind of want to reiterate this, this point again. Um, you have this synthetic gene network, this device, this system inside your paper disk. And what you do is you put this onto the paper disk with your cell extract and the other components to help it uh, uh, express and make the system work. And you freeze dry it and lyophilize it. And when you add your, your sample, it rehydrates everything. So everything is now in liquid form, is not embedded in the paper, and they can kind of go through that reaction. Now, the trigger system is what I want to talk about. So you can trigger the system with a promoter based system, but you can also trigger it using something called a toll hold switch, which is based off of RNA interactions. So now we're going to apply our knowledge of parts. This is what the toehold switch looks like. You can see this is the ORF downstream, the repressed gene, and it's repressed because the upstream promoter region, which includes all this, has been designed so that the ATG that is required to produce the, the ORF downstream is actually locked up in this hairpin structure and also locked up in the hairpin structure is this RBS sequence that is required for, for translation. So these two very important parts that are required for transcription and translation are locked up in this toll hold switch, this hairpin loop uh, structure. And this is a switch RNA in, in more broad terms. And so what happens is that the hairpin is, is locking everything up. And what you need to unlock this whole structure is a trigger RNA. And you can imagine that this trigger RNA could be viral RNA um, that can allow for the detection of disease. So the trigger RNA it will bind to the sequence of DNA, or in this case, RNA, and unlock all of this to release the RBS. And I'm pretty sure the trigger RNA will bind to this strand of the hairpin and unfold it such that the RBS is now exposed and allows for the ribosomes to bind where you get proper expression of your gene. And that's how you trigger the reaction. So you can imagine that in a paper CFS approach, if this trigger RNA and this particular sequence upstream is designed to respond to dengue virus RNA uh, to other things, then you can now create a sensor that reacts only in the presence of our RNA to generate some output. And this is kind of the basis behind LSK 
and the bulk of the Keith Hardy work early in the years, uh, in recent years. And this is an image showing uh, the fluorescence you get from these kind of systems. So you can see that in the presence of the trigger RNA, uh, the fluorescence, you can see there's a lot of green. And in the bright field, you see the paper just looks like this. Uh, without the RNA, well, you actually don't get any fluorescence at all uh, over here. But the bright field looks the same, which is what you would expect. So that summarizes cell-free systems, which you can use as an alternative to expressing plasmids and devices and systems in, in live living cells. Because you can imagine, again, that these paper discs that are de destined to be worked with uh, in health settings, you don't want to have living cells working because they might be pathogenic unintentionally. Having non-living uh, devices that still use biological parts and genes uh, is one good approach to, to have sterility to prevent any uh, risk of, of of infection. Now, in this last fourth section, it's going to be very brief. And what I want to do is introduce you to commercial services that you should be aware of to help speed up the work you do in your lab, assuming you got the money to do that, because these things can get pretty expensive. So now I just want you to focus on the conceptual understanding of how to do, uh, how, how these commercial services uh, can help you. And not, I won't focus too much on how to use uh, the services but I'll give you a bit of an intro to how to navigate the websites. So some of the commercial services include copying and pasting and editing DNA for you. You can just ask IDT, for example, which is one company to do a lot of this process. Uh, but these are things you can do in the lab. What you can't very easily do in the lab or in most facilities is actually write DNA to synthesize it. So in Canada, we like to use IDT and Twist for the most part for our DNA synthesis. So what I'm going to do is show you a video of how to navigate the website. I want to get some water, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you to look through uh, this video to see how to navigate everything. So it's a relatively intuitive process. It's just a matter of trying to find the actual G block gene fragment assembly page, just because they have so many services. But once you get to this gene fragment assembly page, um, or this, this place where you can enter your DNA sequence, once you submit the, the, the DNA sequence, you can just go through the process of where it takes you eventually to the payment. Now that's for IDT. And now I'll show you some, some of it for, for twist bioscience uh, as well. So as you're looking through this, um, if you're asking for my personal opinion for which one to use, IDT and Twist are both equally good. Uh, it just so happens that I use Twist a lot more because they have some pretty streamlined methods for cloning uh, the, the fragments of DNA that I want them to produce into my vector for me so that I'm not receiving vineyard DNA from them. I'm receiving the fully formed construct so that I can immediately start working with it. I can just transform it into my E. coli and then just start with protein expression, which is what I do. Uh, sometimes working with linear fragments can be pretty annoying um, just because you have to go through the whole process of doing PCR to get more of it, to do the whole assembly method to put into the, uh, into the vector for, for cloning or for expression. Twist has a pretty streamlined way to do all of that. And so uh, what you have to do is create an account for both IDT and Twist, and then you can go through their whole uh, process, as I've shown you through these videos. Okay, we've talked about copying, pasting, editing, and writing DNA. You should, not, you should also know about the, the fact that you can read DNA, which is extremely important. So for reading DNA, I'm referring to DNA sequencing. And so, again, most labs and facilities don't do this. You typically ship out your plasmid or, or fragment that you want to sequence to a sequencer company. 
And so most of these companies base their technologies off of automated Sanger sequencing. That's the most straightforward way to do a lot of this stuff. But if you have genome applications that you want to sequence like entire genomes, then typically you have next-gen sequencing or some massively parallel technology. Okay, everyone, welcome to the end of, of this lecture. I'm surprised I actually didn't have to record this throughout the entire day. I woke up at 7 and I'm recording now. It's uh, it's 1 p.m. So I'm still the way I am. My girlfriend hasn't came, come home yet. Um, but congratulations on getting through this lecture. I know it's really long, but this should give you a lot of the, the material jargon and understanding to now readily start working in the lab and communicating some experimental plans that you might have with your members, especially for the iGEM teams. So let's kind of recap what we talked about in this lecture. So genes are composed of parts, and all of these parts can be re-engineered to improve promoter strength, RBS strength, uh, PDT strength. Um, they can be engineered for specific purposes. And by having all of these parts, you can, you can kind of configure them into devices that can behave more com in, in a more sophisticated fashion and systems that have complex tasks. We talked about in section two how DNA is amplified using PCR. And by adding overhangs to your primers, you can add new adapters onto your DNA fragments of interest that might be your devices. And by adding these adapters, you can then clone them using restriction enzyme-based methods or that are, that are ligation dependent or the ligation independent cloning methods like Gibson assembly. And so generally speaking, the ligase independent methods are better when you have multiple uh, inserts to assemble, but a more straightforward, simple approach, if you have very simple stuff to work with, is just using restriction enzymes because it's also relatively cheaper. In the third section, we talked about cell-free systems, uh, how these CFS platforms can be used instead of live cells. Uh, for protein synthesis and to use in sensors for, for paper-based diagnostics. And for the last section that we just talked about, those are some commercial services that you should be aware of that you can access to synthesize your DNA, to make your constructs for you, and to sequence your DNA, which is especially important when you want to troubleshoot, when you want to make sure that your cloning assembly methods work the way you want it to. I recommend you always sequence your stuff to make sure that nothing went wrong. So that sums it up. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this lecture. I now point you over to Mario's lecture where he will focus on molecular cloning, but kind of talk more about the protein-based side of things, whereas I talked about mostly the DNA and the DNA assembly. Thanks for watching, guys. Stay safe, stay fresh, and I'll see you around the channel. Cheers.